The title for this evening's service is Lost. Sometimes you lose. Now, that's not something we like to hear. We like to be inspired to win. And there's all kinds of motivational phrases about being a winner. You know, a champion is someone who gets up when they can't. Or if you can dream it, you can do it. Or winners don't wait for chances, they take them. Or winning isn't everything, but wanting to win is. In sports, there are principles like you have to hate losing more than you love winning. We don't like to lose. But you know what? Sometimes you lose. I'm not saying you should like to lose, yet sometimes we still do. Tonight is about losing. Jesus is betrayed, arrested, has an unfair trial, is beaten and mocked, nailed to a cross, and dies. It's all about taking the loss, experiencing loss. And we all know what it's like to lose. Loss comes in many forms. A car accident that totals your car, or a business venture that goes south, or a cancer diagnosis, or divorce, fallout with children, parents, friends, and you don't talk to them anymore, death. And when we lose, dreams die, hope fades, fears are realized, disappointment sets in. And it's not just that we don't like to lose, we don't like to be around those who lose. Uh, teams that win championships have a lot more fans than teams that never make the playoffs. The rich have more people wanting to be their friends than the poor have wanting to be their friends. Ask any widow or widower, and they will tell you after their spouse died, their friends showed up less as time went on. When you win, lots of people want to be around you. When you lose, not so much. And this happened to Jesus. As we read in Luke chapter 26, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, the one I kiss is the man, arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. The week started with so much promise. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The city was flooded with people coming to celebrate the Passover, the festival, to celebrate their deliverance from Egyptian slavery. Crowds came out to cheer Jesus. Disciples, his disciples were convinced Jesus was the Messiah. And the reaction Jesus got from the crowds raised their expectations that Jesus was about to fulfill his role as Savior, restore Israel to its past glory, and they were going to be a part of it. 
their three years of following Jesus was going to result in something historic. And then the unthinkable happens. An armed crowd comes to arrest Jesus, led by one of their own. Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. And then one disciple springs into action. If it's a fight they want, it's a fight they'll get. And this is the moment they've been waiting for, and he draws out his sword and swings into action. And to what must have been to his surprise, Jesus stops him. And Jesus doesn't give him some inspirational battle cry. If you can dream it, you can do it, or winners don't, take, don't wait for chances, they take them. Instead, he says, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. There will be no fight. There will be no conquering. Jesus is arrested. Jesus loses. This isn't what they signed up for. They signed up to win, not lose. And in their disillusionment, surprise, and fear, they all desert him. Just as Jesus predicted hours earlier when he said in Matthew 26, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus has lost. And Jesus experiences what all losers experience. He is left alone. Jesus is deserted by all. But there was one who claimed he would never desert him even if the others did. Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' first disciples. Jesus called Peter to follow him and become a fisher of men. Peter saw Jesus feed the 5,000, cast out demons, give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, speech to the mute, and made the lame walk. Peter was a part of Jesus' inner circle. When Jesus went to raise a little girl from the dead, he only took three of his disciples with him. Peter was one of them. When Jesus went to the top of a mountain to be transfigured and visited by Elijah and Moses, he only took three of his disciples with him. Peter was one of them. When the disciples were in the boat on the Sea of Galilee and a storm came up upon them in the night, and Jesus came walking on the water, and they thought he was a ghost. And Jesus said, it is I. Peter was the only one who got out of the boat and walked on water with Jesus. When Jesus asked who they thought he was, it was Peter who replied, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. In fact, Peter wasn't even Peter's original name. His name was Simon. Peter means rock, which was the name Jesus gave him. Jesus calls Simon by a new name. He says, you are the rock. And Peter, the rock, promised Jesus that very night, even if all fall away, I will not. And when they arrested Jesus, it was Peter who cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And when the other disciples scattered, Peter did this in Luke 22. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. And Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire, in the middle of the courtyard, and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight, and she looked closely at him and said, 
This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly, this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him, before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And Peter went outside and wept bitterly. He said he would not fall away even if everyone else did. And so Peter follows Jesus to the house of the high priest. And there in the courtyard, he was as close to Jesus as he could get. In fact, he was within Jesus' eyesight. And then the moment of truth came by the fire. This man was with him, and Peter denies, woman, I don't know him. Someone else says, you are one of them. And Peter denies, I am not an hour goes by and someone else says, you were with him, you're a Galilean. And Peter denies, I don't know what you're talking about. And before he finishes his last denial, the rooster crows. Peter denied him three times, just as Jesus told him. And after the rooster crows, Jesus turns and looks straight at Peter. And Peter goes outside the courtyard and weeps bitterly. That is failure at its worst. That is what it looks like to lose. Jesus is deserted by his disciples, denied by the one closest to him, and now Jesus heads to his death. Mark 15. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way, in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. And they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. 
This is what it looks like to lose. The disciples lost. Peter lost. Jesus lost. We know. We know what it's like to lose. We are familiar with betrayal. We are familiar with failure. We are familiar with death. Not just familiar with losing in our everyday life, it's true in our faith as well. We are familiar with betraying our faith in Jesus. We are familiar with failing in our faith in Jesus. And we are familiar with times it feels like our faith in Jesus is dead. What do we do then? Right before Jesus was arrested, he had one last meal with his disciples. He gave them bread and told them, this is my body broken for you. He gave them wine and told them, this is my blood shed for you. And then he said something a little strange. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And now I'm paraphrasing, but basically he goes on to say, this is the last time I will eat and drink with you until the kingdom comes. However, you keep eating and drinking this meal in remembrance of me. The disciples would do just that. The disciples would eventually come back and share that meal together without Jesus. And I wonder what it was like for those disciples to do that. Those who deserted Jesus for the one who denied Jesus. Where they ate and drank and remembered Jesus and everything Jesus said and everything Jesus did. It's almost like Jesus knew that they were going to need that moment, a holy moment to revisit, knowing that they would fail miserably. And Jesus didn't want them to walk away forever. And so in his mercy, Jesus wanted to give them something to come back to. I believe the first time they celebrated that meal in his remembrance, it grounded their faith in Jesus in a new way. When they came together that first time and every time after, it was a we will never forget moment. When Jesus had his last supper with his disciples, and told them when they do this without him in the future to do it in remembrance of him. He did it to ground them once again in their faith so that whenever they fell short of living their lives worthy of him, they would come back and remember what their faith in him was about in the first place. In his mercy, Jesus wanted to give them something to come back to. And that's the power of this table. We know what it's like to lose. We betray our faith in Jesus. We fail in our faith in Jesus. Sometimes it feels like our faith in Jesus is dead. Well, what are we supposed to do then? Well, Jesus, in his mercy, gave us something to come back to. We come back to the table. We commune with Jesus in a meal, a meal in which we remember him and we remember what our faith is about in the first place. 
where we receive God's grace and be grounded again in our faith. Communion grounds our faith even when we fail. Communion grounds our faith every time we fail. Losing, it's a part of faith. It's been that way from the beginning. We come to the table to be anchored in the faith in Jesus. Just because we fail miserably sometimes, it's not the end. Jesus lost on our behalf so that in our moments of loss, our moments of loss are never the end. Lord, as we come and remember when you were betrayed, arrested, denied, mocked, flogged, and crucified, as we come to remember your death, we are reminded of the ways we fail in our faith. And we thank you that you lost, you died on our behalf so that our failures are never the end of our faith in you. Lord, help this moment again ground us in our faith in a new way, remembering your grace and mercy knows no end. In the name of our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.